Great. Uh, we might go ahead and make a start, I think. I, I can see that more people are joining, um, but, but they'll, uh, I'm sure, be in this room in, in just a couple of minutes. Um, my name's Phil Clark. I'm a professor of international politics at SOAS in London. Um, I'm also the co-director of the Centre on Conflict Rights and Justice, which is the centre that's uh, running uh, today's webinar. Um, this is the first uh, centre event uh, for the year. And uh, in an ideal universe, we'd all be physically in the same space. But I guess the, the virtue of uh, having this online reality is that we can have participants from all over the world. I was just quickly looking down the list of participants and many of you are old friends and very familiar to me. I can see we've got people logging in from Canada, uh, the US, Australia, uh, South Africa, uh, just to name a few. So we wouldn't have been able to have all of you involved uh, if we weren't doing this online. So I guess that is definitely a, a silver lining to this COVID-19 um, situation. Um, it, it's a real privilege uh, to have Umar Ba come and, and give this very first uh, webinar in our series. Um, and Umar, of course, is going to talk about his fantastic new book, uh, States of Justice, The Politics of the International Criminal Court. Um, those of you who've been following the debates around the ICC in the last year or so will know just how prominent Umar's book has been um, and, and the, the splash that it's already made, um, not least uh, with the online symposium um, on Opinio Juris and, and lots of other debates that have already been generated by, by his really important book. So um, Umar, we're absolutely delighted uh, to have you uh, come and speak to us uh, today today. Um, we've also got a fantastic discussant uh, to provide some commentary on Umar's book, um, Kelly Jo Bluen um, from LSE, who also I know is very well known to all of you. Um, absolutely fantastic to, to have Joe with us as well. I'm going to introduce both Umar and Joe properly uh, in just a moment. Um, but just let me quickly just discuss the format uh, for this event. I should say too, we're recording the event. Um, so uh, this is on the record uh, for those of you who are concerned about uh, that kind of thing. Um, Umar is going to present for about 40 minutes or so, um, particularly based off, off the back of his book, States of Justice. Uh, Kelly Joe is then going to give us about 10 minutes of commentary um, on the book. I then want to come back to Umar and give him a chance to respond uh, to the things that uh, Kelly Joe has raised. And that will probably leave us with about 40 minutes for uh, discussion and questions and answers um, with, with all of you. Um, so before that, l let me introduce our speakers formally. Um, Umar Bar is, of course, um, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Morehouse College. Uh, his research focuses predominantly on international justice norms and regimes. Uh, he also does a huge amount of work around uh, the global governance of atrocity crimes. He is, of course, the author of the book uh, that he's here to discuss today, States of Justice, the Politics of the International Criminal Court, which came out recently with Cambridge University Press. Uh, he's got an incredible publication record. Um, he's published in Human Rights Quarterly and the African Studies uh, Review and, and, and elsewhere. So uh, really is going to, to bring to bear on today's discussion a, a really rich vein of, of research and publications over the last few years. Um, and our discussant, uh, Kelly Jo Bluen, she's a PhD candidate in international relations uh, at LSE. Uh, she's, of course, the editor of um, Millennium, uh, the, the Journal of International Studies. Uh, Kelly Jo, of course, organized uh, the Millennium Conference last year, which I think will live long in the memory. I must confess that I missed it, um, which, which is a personal tragedy of mine. But anyone who was at that conference says that uh, it's the kind of conference that people will talk about for 20 or 30 years after the event, which which is certainly not the average thing that people say about academic conferences. So uh, Kelly Jo is also really shaping so many debates. Um, and her own research looks at issues of anti-blackness and anti-Semitism, especially in terms of the, the legacies of uh, the Nuremberg trials and, and, and the way that that has been interpreted and, and, and understood in subsequent uh, decades. So uh, two really fantastic speakers um, to present to us today. And again, on behalf of uh, the centre and also on behalf of the politics department, Umar and, and Kelly Joe, it's a real delight to have you here and, and welcome to all of you uh, who are joining us from around the world. Um, with no further ado, I want to hand over to Umar now um, to, to hear from you. Thanks very much. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Clark. Um, 
this is a, an honor of mine to be able to have this uh, discussion today with you all. Um, thanks also to uh, Kelly Joe for uh, taking up um, the task of uh, providing comments um, to this. I want also to thank uh, all the audience, um, everybody who's been who's here this morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. These are incredibly challenging time for all of us. So again, um, I really appreciate that you all are able to join us uh, in this uh, discussion. And if you allow me, I would also like to apologize to my good friends, uh, Oviso and uh, Sherry for bursting their uh, ICC bubble this morning on Twitter. They had requested that I apologize uh, in public. So there it is. Um, I want to make one um, big argument um, today, I think. Um, and the argument which may also seem simple enough is that international criminal law and international criminal justice are inherently political. Um, one question I want to grapple with is why is it that the ICC seems able to deliver justice only on behalf of states rather than for victims and communities who are affected by atrocity crimes? And what are the implications of such a state-oriented judicial mechanism? How does the state-oriented judicial mechanism square with the ending impunity narrative? And also, how does it square with the justice for victim, quote unquote, narrative? So international courts, I argue, operate in a world made primarily of states. Now, I should also say that um, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a legal scholar, I'm a trained uh, in, uh, in political science and international relations. So I approach these questions from, from that perspective. So I'll add that those states try to leverage the legal institutions and processes in pursuit of their political and security interest. The ICC then cannot resist being instrumentalized by states. Even the states that do not wield the global power, and in the book I refer to them for lack of a better word, as um, weaker states in the international system. And certainly African states would fit into that description. So states that do not wield global power are able to use international courts in pursuit of their interest. Those states are able to leverage their stateness to obstruct, influence, or instrumentalize the court. They strategically self-refer situations to the ICC. They shift between compliance and non-compliance as they see fit. And they outsource their political disputes to The Hague. Uh, I should also add that the court and the states are not always in competition. They are, the court and the state are oftentimes able to accommodate one another and collaborate with one another. They can develop working relationships where in the interest of the court and those of the states at a given moment converge. Now I will provide a very brief summary of some of the main arguments of the book, and then I will open up um, the discussion to uh, the implications and the broader questions. So to summarize the main argument of the book, one, one research question that I engage and grapple with is why and how do states engage with the ICC, especially states that do not wield global power? In other words, what mechanisms and strategies do states develop in reaction to and within regimes of international criminal justice? To what extent are weaker states 
in the international system able to use the ICC as a leverage in their pursuit of political and security interest. Consequently, what lessons can we draw from such a mechanism in terms of the primacy of states' interest vis-a-vis -vis norms of international justice? The empirical focus of the book revolves around four major themes that are all at the intersection of states' power and interest with the ICC. Uh, the first major theme I discuss is the strategic use of self-referrals, which has been discussed a lot in, in the literature. So I'm not saying anything new on this specific question, which is that states would often use self-referrals to the ICC as a way to remove or incapacitate local adversaries, whether they are rebel leaders or political opposition. And this tends to happen in situations where the state is fragile or fragmented, or when you have a government that has come to power after a military coup, or in the aftermath of contentious elections, a volatile political situation and states would use this self referral mechanism to the ICC to establish an asset legitimacy and state control. This is also an argument that um, Phil Clark has made in, in his book, A Distant Justice. Um, the second theme is the complementarity between national and international justice systems, wherein we can see the ICC being used as the core of first resort or even only resort when in reality the ICC should have been, that's how it was conceptualized, as the core of last resort. So in this sense, the ICC is used as a bad bank where states would outsource their problems. The third theme is limits of state compliance. So I discuss compliance and non-compliance as dynamic tools um, that states would wield depending on the political risk that the ICC may pose to, to the elites or the state agents. Um, states are more likely to comply and cooperate with the ICC if and when they are assured that the investigation and prosecution, for instance, will not extend to their own agents. And finally, the ICC being used um, as the stage for domestic political disputes, a domestic political arena. Then the book contents ultimately that African states have been able to use the court instrumentally and strategically uh, to their advantage. And then I develop a theoretical framework that would explain the range of behaviors that are associated with um, the states engaging uh, with the court and what can be expected in the future of how do such a states will continue to engage with the court. I'll repeat the main argument again. Even states that do not wield the global power are able to use international courts in pursuit of their interest. Those states are able to leverage their stateness to abstract influence and instrumentalize the court. They strategically self-refer situations to the ICC, they shift between compliance and non-compliance, and they outsource their political disputes to the ICC. Now, simple enough, why would that be a problem? Well, it is because the ICC and the international criminal justice system are still in denial about the political dimension of their product and its instrumentalization for political and security goals. So the ICC is still in denial. For a long time, and that's still the case, I would argue, the international criminal justice system has sought to divorce itself from international politics because of the anxiety of being perceived as a mere tool for power politics. 
a quick Twitter discussion I had this morning, for instance, with uh, Open Society that published a new report um, talking about um, the upcoming elections for judges at the ICC, basically saying that states should refrain from uh, uh, campaigning for their nominees and then they should refrain from fading votes. Now, in a perfect world where you could divorce the ICC from politics, that would have been possible, but how in the world would states not campaign for the judges that they have nominated to sit at the court? But again, this takes us back to this view or this perception that the ICC is above politics and political considerations and should remain so. The International Justice Project still holds on to the belief that personal accountability for atrocity crimes has become a widely adopted shared norms that state believe that this is the right thing to do. They have been socialized into this norm and this is what I'm sure all of you are familiar with, the Justice Cascade argument, which also says that the arc of this Justice Cascade bends towards a brighter future of an international legal order, that this progress that's been made. And this would put the pursuit of justice for the victims, which is the mantra that the international justice system uses, the pursuit for justice for victims is perceived as a moral call, a duty that is beyond reproach. And the lofty goals of ending impunity operate outside and above political considerations. I argue, however, that the ICC, I'm not arguing, rather, I'm not saying that the ICC has become a political institution or has been politicized. What I'm trying to say is that the foundation of this project was political from the beginning, from day one. This was a political project. Why? Because, well, the Rome Statute, which is the founding document of the court, is a political document. It is made through political compromise by actors who had competing interests. But also the definitions and delimitations of material, temporal, or territorial jurisdiction of these courts, their mandates, are always reflective of power dynamics. Uh, as uh, Kamarani Parker has argued recently. What counts as core crimes or crimes of great concern to humanity as a whole, the non-retroactivity non principle, um, temporal jurisdictions, secretarial discretion, all these are enmeshed with political and racial constructs, I would argue. The yellow brick road from Nuremberg to the Hague, which charts this trajectory of humanity from the darkness of international lawlessness to the promise of a civilized era of justice, is, as Kelly Jo said recently, a fairy tale. The focus on norms and institutions of international justice uh, such as courts, commissions of inquiry, fact-finding missions, prosecutions, and trials. The focus on these items as a measure of a justice cascade and how much of progress has been made from Nuremberg to The Hague, this obscures, I argue, the problematic foundations of the project and how it is deployed and wielded both at the international and local levels which leads the ICC's constituency to become reduced in reality to nothing but itself. ICC interventions 
or lack thereof, whether they are justified by their own statute or not, do have real consequences on local communities and domestic politics. And these consequences oftentimes are actually harmful to those local communities. Then beating the drum that we are doing it for the victims, as the ICC proponents tend to repeat, this is about the victims. This does not adequately address that problem, which is the role and agency of states, and African states in this case, is not necessarily a reflection of the concern of the local communities. States oftentimes do not actually speak for the local communities. Um, states oftentimes do not act on behalf of or in the interest of specific local communities who have been victimized by political violence. That takes us to the question of the victim. The ICC refuses to see politics. It doesn't see race either, but that's a discussion for, for another day. It only sees the victims. And the ICC compensates. It's a failure to deliver that for which it was created by reorienting itself towards the politics of representation of the victims. Um, and there's a lot of work that has been done on about this narrative um, by Kamari Clark and Meg Ray and uh, Olivia Lanter Moss as well. This justice for victim narrative is uniform across different contexts and conflicts. In any situation in which the ICC has been involved, there is this narrative of we're doing this for the victims, we're bringing justice on behalf of the victims. And this narrative, this justice for victim narratives, is um, it, it um, overtakes all other potential objectives, such as the truth, peace, reconciliation, reparation, etc. The justice for victims becomes the ultimate telos, the raison d'etre of the ICC project. And the legitimacy of the International Justice Project rests on such a narrative. In the words of uh, David Luban, quote, international criminal justice will always be an extraordinary institution that perpetually needs to pursue the world of its own legitimacy. And the legitimacy of the ICC reposes on its own reification, which has become a crisis of its own. And the crisis of reification of the ICC is the idea that criminal justice and individual criminal accountability are the appropriate venue to deal and prevent crimes. As Prosecutor Ben Suda said, quote, without the ICC, we will regress into an even more turbulent world where chaos, volatility, and violence take the upper hand as inevitable norms. So the court changes the world simply by existing. This is the claim that they make, that the world is hanging on a very tiny little thread. If that were to break, we will all plunge into an abyss of chaos and violence will be unleashed. And the only thing protecting us from such chaos is actually the mere existence of this court, um, no matter how ineffective it is. So this is the claim. This is the reification of the ICC that I'm talking about. That's part of my 
the narrative of progress um, from Nuremberg to, to The Hague, and this narrative still prevails. The ICC is viewed as a driver of this mass narrative, this civilizing process of, quote, introducing the rule of law into the cynical, sordid culture of international politics. This same international justice narrative and the reification of the ICC forecloses any possibility for the court to curtail its ambition and to recognize its structural flaws and limitations. Um, to conclude, I would say in, in the late 90s, when the ICC came into existence, there was, it was welcomed, the ICC was welcomed into this era of accountability with some triumphant and jubilous language. Um, for instance, um, Kofi Annan in 1998 said that the ICC is, quote, a gift of hope to future generations and a giant step forward in the march towards the universal human rights and the rule of law, end quote. But two decades later, we see that victims have felt abandoned and frustrated by the court. We see that state compliance and cooperation remains elusive. The ICC is nearly incapable of successfully prosecuting high-ranking state officials, even, high rank, even state officials from African countries, actually. The fundamental role of criminal trials and the Hague's version of justice are in question through the Hague, I mean, though the Hague um, refuses to grapple with these questions. And the experts reveal that's being done um, on the ICC seem to focus on the assessment of the court's performance and the shortcomings of the court in terms of institutional governance and um, work culture, workplace culture at the court, not the broader questions. So what's the future of the court and what's the future of this international uh, criminal justice project? That's unclear. The, report from the experts that was published a couple of weeks ago has pointed to some directions and made some interesting recommendations and it has addressed to some sore points but the politics of the politics are still outside of the picture they're still outside of the debate regarding the ICC and the instrumentalization by states is still not addressed um, race and racism do not appear anywhere in this 348-page report, and thanks to Oriso for pointing this out. These questions will go beyond fixing the ICC, which is the call that the four past presidents of the ASP had made um, last year that the ICC, the ICC needs fixing. I think this points to broader questions of what sustains the international justice project is the foundations of international law and western liberalism and humanity and they avoid any discussion of the imperialist and colonial origins that perpetuates the international justice agenda too therefore as long as the icc is viewed as central or the de facto institutions that shows humanity's progress, it will be difficult to grapple with the extent to which the international justice project itself has structural flaws. This ending impunity and justice for the victim narratives will continue to obscure the serious critiques of the court and other institutions of the international criminal justice regime and their ideology and instruments. We would 
continue to view the ICC's crisis as simple bumps in the road towards a more perfect world of justice, rather than those structural flaws that are rooted on the foundations of the project itself. Meanwhile, maybe the focus of the prosecutor's office would be to add a few Filipino, Burmese, or East Europeans to the docket and steer so as to foreclose the debate about the focus on Africa itself. But again, this is a fix, but not a solution to, to these uh, problems or an answer to, to these questions. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Uh, thanks, Omar. Um, plenty to discuss, plenty to debate in, in what you've said there, but I'm going to hand straight over to Kelly Jo uh, for her discussions, comments, and then Omar, I'll come back to you for a, a couple of minutes to respond to what Kelly Jo has said. Thanks, Kelly Jo. Hi, Mike. Is that okay? Hi there. Yeah, there we go. Um, Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Phil, for having me and thank you, Umar, for, for writing this book and for, for being in conversation with us and for allowing us to think with you. Um, I think this book is remarkably important and I think uh, one of the things that's really interesting about Umar is that he is at once one of our finest thinkers on the, the specificities of how international justice works. Uh, when you read the book, the empirical granularity, the depth of it is is remarkable. And at the same time, and I think it's it's really interesting how how this this talk that he has just given has moved from from this kind of deracinated, depoliticized politics of the ICC into the systemic issues of white supremacy, of racism, of colonialism that 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 this court speaks to, speaks with, produces and creates. And I think uh, it's really powerful how Umar manages to move between these spaces uh, and to show us, in fact, that it is not a movement between, but it is the self-same space. So I feel, in fact, that the conference that you mentioned very much was a collective project and came from many different conversations, many of which were with Umar. And, and one of my favorite pieces in the special issue that will come out of that is a, a reflective piece by Umar talking about the kind of subjectivities and politics and racial politics around doing the research for this very book. Uh, and I think it's really beautiful how Umar holds those things together. Um, I want to talk about this yellow brick road, which, uh, as I described it in the Opinion Euris piece, which Umar Bhatt says charts the trajectory of humanity's progress from the darkness of the lawlessness uh, of lawlessness to the promise of an, a civilized era of justice. Um, and I think it's really, I think it's really interesting because one of the things that is governed there is the idea that that Nuremberg is is the starting moment and therefore the Holocaust uh, and particularly a very particular notion of, of what was contained there uh, is the exception and in order to make that possible of course uh, you have to suggest that that if you're talking about the notion of a crime against humanity, the first use of the term crime against humanity that we know of is by George Washington Williams, black American lawyer and journalist in response in a letter to King Leopold in response to uh, the absolute heinous atrocities in the Congo Free State. And that does not form part of the lexicon of our international justice moment. Uh, my friend Zoe Samudzi, who I think is on the session here, writes about the, the Herrera Nama genocide by indeed by the Germans, uh, which, you know, within a similar temporal space, within a similar geographic space, that is also not written into a national, international lexicon of genocide. Um, and I think what's really important here and to, to is, is the idea that we are governed by a logic of inevitability that 
this that a particular instantiation of fascism as seen in the Second World War is the ultimate evil and that a juridical approach to addressing it is the only way. Uh, now, of course, if you look at the writings, for example, of Emma Goldman, Jewish and anarchist contemporary of Lemkin, we see a lot of different approaches to how we address fascism. And when we fast forward, I suppose, to how the international justice architecture today is intersecting with anti-fascists fighting fascism in the United States, for example, I don't see the bonds of solidarity there. I don't see, um, I see international justice seeking to assert itself um, rather than saying, how are we collectively working against fascism? International justice's response to Donald Trump's brazen genocidal actions in, in the United States is not to say, how can we be in collective uh, fighting of this fascism? It is to say, how can we focus on the particular instantiations where the international justice project is threatened? So, I suppose where I think I start and I want to come into this this conversation is is this idea what if we take seriously and Umar I think you said uh, the court changes the world simply by existing uh, and the court believes this and what I, I think I what I take from your book and what I want us to think about is how does that work and how, you know it, it it thinks it works for positive what you are showing is that it works quite a lot for negative and how do we think about that and think about how we respond to that and I think one of the things that's really phenomenal about this book and I think Umar has undersold it I will say that uh, I think one of the things that's phenomenal is that if we have a juridical architecture that is in the business of of Focusing on contradiction, there is a contradiction between civilization and barbarism. There is a con contradiction between good and evil. We see this replicated very much in a critical space uh, where we, the critics, all of us, better, we are better than the liberals or worse than the liberals or different to the liberals or absolutely dislocated from the project that we are critiquing, all of us, I see us in the business, and I use the term business very pointedly, of showing the contradictions and inconsistencies to an order, ourselves, whose continuity depends not on overcoming these contradictions, but in a simultaneous rendering of these contradictions as existence and also of the institution that produces them as ultimately always successful. So I read this, when I read this in, in, in the last chapter of Umar's book, he says the ICC is a court in permanent crisis, and yet it always manages to be the court that is the answer for humanity. I think so much of us are really, really busy showing how there are contradictions, these little cracks that show actually it is in crisis, it's not legitimate. What Umar is saying to us is that it's in both. It is supposed to be both in crisis and the answer to humanity, and that is perhaps how it sustains itself. So the way that Umar does this, which is so powerful and also again quite quiet in its power, and I I, I don't I don't know if I'm in, you know, my first job was as a magician's assistant, and and one of the things you know is that you never give away the tricks, you break the magic code. So I don't know if I'm if I'm breaking the poetry, but one of the things that Umar does so well here is he takes, he's not doing some great, you know, we love in international law, everyone wants to be a grand macro theorist. We have the big theory on the whole world. Umar is taking a particular point, a particular juncture and showing how it cracks. Um, and the particular juncture that Umar is taking is this idea of the justice cascade. And he is showing that this idea that has dominated um, our, in our, our political and our intellectual space, which suggests that there is an inevitable progression from lawlessness to peace via a cascade of justice, whereby the, the barbarians are being incorporated into the system, Umar is showing, which is really not that unsurprising, that states, in fact, engage with the international justice architecture for many reasons. 
because surprisingly enough, states in the global south are entirely capable of doing many different things in relation to a justice architecture. So I think this is, and this is this, another contribution that I really want to focus on, is that it's not just an empirical site. And I think one of the things, I mean, Sabello and Lovogaceni talks a lot about how Africa becomes a site of empirics while the West is a site of theory. And I think when we look at what Umar is giving us here, it is an empirical space to theorize the international. So when Donald Trump is, is um, uh, targeting the, the, the prosecutor of the ICC with sanctions, uh, it is absolutely no one asks questions about whether he's acting in state self-interest or not. No one does this. It's, it's, it's okay for Western states to do that. What Umar is showing us is that this is what states do. So I think um, what I, I'm conscious that I need to, uh, to wrap up. And I think uh, what I want to say is I, I don't want to, I want to continue a conversation that Umar and I have been having for a long time uh, about this idea of the court in permanent crisis. Um, the court has always been in crisis. The court, I think I relies on the idea of both crisis and perfectibility, uh, which is ultimately a colonial logic. Um, and yet we are all trying to frustrate and show empirically how the, the crisis doesn't, this is illogical when in fact it is a fairy tale. As I have said, it is supposed to be illogical. So I want to suggest that we use this moment to move beyond the crisis and outside of the imaginaries. Because the map between Nuremberg and The Hague is not a spatial map, but cartography is always a colonial enterprise. So what I want to end with, and I think ask Umar to, to help us think through, and I don't expect an answer, but I think just in the fact of, in the, in the act of talking about this, maybe we can collectively start imagining something else. And I want to talk, I suppose I want to, to focus on two points here. And the one is critique and the other is justice and the interlinking between them. In a recent piece from a couple of weeks ago on, on critique in times of crisis, Hortense Spillers says, it has occurred to me before now that the only, only by way of example, that critical theory in its varied iterations witnesses its most impressive moments and efflorescence in times of crisis. What happens if we look at this moment where the world is literally on fire, where the ICC is at the center of much of the world that is on fire, and say, what do we do in this moment of crisis? In Umar's book, he writes, let me find the line. The court itself may need to acknowledge that it can only deliver justice that is both political, selective, and partial. He does not say we must have to acknowledge. He says the court must have to acknowledge. So for those of us who want a better world or want a better notion of justice, how do we think out of this? And I think to end, I'd like to just end with the thoughts of, of one of my other favorite thinkers also on here, uh, Yasin Bronja, who also has a CUP book forthcoming soon uh, on, on notions of justice. And one of the things that I've had the privilege of kind of watching this book as, as well emerge, and I think it's in such beautiful conversation with, with Umar's book, is what do we mean by justice and what kind of articulations of justice, liberatory versions of justice, can coexist within this liberal legal framework, but not only within the liberal legal framework, within the critical mass space outside of that, where we are articulating notions of justice, but feel so stuck within this logic. So I think in conclusion, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Umar and to for this, this truly remarkable book and this opportunity to think about justice within and beyond the court, and to ask you to help us think how we might think of critique and justice in this moment as the world is on fire. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Kelly Joe. That I think, you know, really 
helps us start to to see that the the the, the big significance of Umar's book in terms of you know, current global events, uh, but also big debates at the moment about the court, uh, about uh, the place of criminal justice in the, the the pantheon of institutions designed to deal with with mass atrocity, but also the place of, of critique um, and, and the role of, of academic commentary as well in, in many of these debates. Umar, I wanted to come back to you just for a, a couple of minutes to respond to anything that Kelly Joe said, and then I'm going to open it up uh, to the rest of the group. All right, um, thank you, Kelly Joe, for these uh, pointed uh, remarks and, uh, and comments. I always learn something new about the book when I hear Kelly Joe commenting about the book. Um, so um, to address quickly this question about crimes against humanity, for instance, and um, we obviously cannot discuss crimes against humanity without trying to uh, look deeper into humanity itself, um, who counts as this humanity, who is included in, uh, in, this, uh, in this label. And uh, one way of um, doing this, and I've been trying to think through um, lately, is going back to the genealogy of this notion itself. Um, it's a history, but also going back to the genesis of the ICC itself. How did the ICC came to be, for instance? And to do that, we ought to go beyond just the Rome Conference, because in many ways, what happened in Rome in 1998 was already a done deal. This was the last remaining few disagreements that states were trying to uh, grapple with. But um, we would probably need to go back as far as the ILC, the International Law Commission, um, look at all of these uh, UN-sponsored conferences and committees that were put together in, uh, in the early 90s. And then try to see, for instance, and I've learned so much about looking at what did the African delegates say during these meetings, these conferences in the early 90s. You, you would have, for instance, a state like Lesotho saying, um, we need to make sure that the UN gives us enough resources, money, so our delegates can travel to these conferences so we can fully participate. This court can be successful only if it has a broad participation by everybody. Um, you have a state like Haiti that said, for instance, that we fully support an international criminal court because we were victims of slavery. That was a great injustice. We need a court to make sure that this does not happen again. Um, all the states will talk about, for instance, the need to include the threat of the use of nuclear weapons as a crime against humanity that should be under the jurisdiction of the ICC, or the states would talk about the need to make sure that the ICC is totally independent from the UN Security Council, for instance. So we, we can learn so much about the visions that African states, for instance, had, what kind of court they want to come out of, of this negotiation and what the end result was. Um, and this is uh, the last point I will make here about um, critique itself, the role of critique, and what does it tell us for justice at, at, the, at the ICC. Um, the goal, if there is one here, is probably, as Kelly Joe said, to bring the ICC to the, to the realization and acknowledgement that it, it will keep failing as long as it keeps the same goal, that the goal that it tries to achieve that was enshrined in the Rome Statute as not deliverable. So there's a call for some humility, reconsideration, and also an 
the opening of the space to allow all the conceptions of justice, of politics, of accountability to, to take hold. Um, for instance, a couple of weeks ago, you know, the, the Financial Times has this very interesting feature where the journalists will go and have lunch with someone. So it's called a lunch with the FT. And so they go to a nice restaurant, they eat a nice meal, and then they talk, and then the journalist writes about it. So Fatou Ben Souda was invited to the lunch with the FT um, a couple of weeks ago, and the headline for that article was quoting Ben Souda as saying, it's not about power, it's about the law. And that was her response to, to the sanctions that the Trump administration has uh, put on her and the, and the prosecutor's office. So in other words, we could translate that as to mean also Ben Suda saying what we're doing has nothing to do with politics, just about the law. And my, my reaction was, my God, she still doesn't get it, or at least she still refuses to get it. How can you look at what Trump administration is imposing on the ICC and still say what you're trying to do has nothing to do with politics? It has nothing to do with power. We're just following the Rome Statute, and that's what we'll keep doing. I uh, will stop there. Great. Thanks so much, Uma. Um, what I want to do now is open it up to everybody else. I think the simple way to do this is uh, you, you've got a, a hand function. Um, if you look at your, uh, you look at the, the, the screen, at the bottom of the screen, there's a little logo with its hand in the air. If, if you'd like to speak, um, literally just press that button. That'll tell me that you've got a question or a, or a comment uh, that you'd like to make. And I'll basically take them in the order in which they appear on the screen. And what I would ask people to do is when I throw to you to speak, if you could just introduce yourself so that uh, Umar and the rest of us know exactly who you are. So uh, who would like to start us off? Yes, yeah, sit, sit in belly. Yeah, please. Um, over to Hi. You. Yeah, if people Thank would like you. to turn their videos on, if if you're able to turn your video on, that would be great because it's uh it's nice to see people's faces. Uh, I'm not sure if um I can do that. Yes. That's right. Uh, can't. That's fine. No, it does seem to be working. Um. Hi, everyone, and thanks so much, uh, Uma, for writing the book and for um, really providing a perspective on the ICC that has been kind of desperately needed. And um, I find that anecdote you gave about um, about Patu Ben Suda and her, her continued refusal to talk about um, the politics of the ICC are uh, really fascinating. And because I research the UN Security Council, in particular um, the role of uh, elected members of the Security Council from the global uh, Fascinating is what you the relationship between the Security Council the referral um, between the Council and the ICC that seems to the work uh, of, of the court. So I'd like to hear from you, firstly, what you think the fate of that referral mechanism will be. Uh, do you think that there's any chance of, uh, I know from the South African perspective, uh, that, this, that part of the reason why the South African government is saying they want to leave um, the ICC is particularly around the referral mechanism, which South Africa was opposed to in the original um, negotiations uh, on 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 the um, on on the on the court. So um, on the statute. So I'd like to hear your opinion on you know where do you think that referral mechanism is is going to go? And then um, secondly. I, as you know, because I wrote, uh, I contributed to the symposium about the book, uh, what I thought was most fascinating is about the agency of um, 
African states and states of the global south more broadly in relation to the ICC and how the ICC gets tangled um, in, in internal politics or domestic politics uh, of different states. And it seems to me that from a conflict resolution and security perspective, the existence of the ICC has actually very poorly for the resolution of many conflicts on the continent because it acts as this external, um, as a stick that incumbents can use against um, the rebels or those who oppose them internally um, and really makes it difficult to find political solutions to conflicts. Uh, I'd like to hear your view on that. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Sintabele. Um, yeah, Uma, back, back to you. And then I can see that Owisto is also uh, wanting to jump in. But uh, Uma, a, a response to Sintabele, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Sintabele, uh, for these uh, very important questions. Uh, regarding the the referrals, um, and I believe you are talking specifically about the UN Security Council uh, referrals um, to ICC, which so far has occurred twice uh, in reference to Sudan and uh, and Libya. But it is also the the deferral power that Kenya had tried, for instance, the African Union had tried to get the UN Security Council to use. Uh, which was uh, unsuccessful. So as you know well, um, this is probably the prime example of how the ICC's work is embedded in power politics. Because you have this um, Security Council uh, with uh, P5 members and uh, three of which are not even members of the ICC and who still have this ability of triggering an ICC jurisdiction over a situation in a country, in a state that has not ratified uh, the Rome Statute. And that was a very big point of contention during the negotiation, during the Rome Conference, because a lot of states, especially African states, were against this um, subordinating the ICC to the Security Council. Some wanted total independence from the two. Others, like the United States, wanted actually the prosecutor to work under the supervision of the Security Council, so total control of the Security Council. And the compromise that was made between those two positions, uh, which is called the Singaporean Compromise, was to give the Security Council the power to refer or defer um, prosecutions. Now, that's a very problematic issue, especially even in the two instances where the Security Council has used its power to refer cases to the ICC. The language that is used, for instance, in these resolutions also specifically say that we allow you, the ICC, to go into Sudan or Libya to investigate, but your investigation must focus only on Sudanese nationals or Libyan nationals. So that's written in the resolution actually, which means that the ICC, Ben Sudan, has the power to investigate and prosecute Libyans, but not NATO members who were bombing Libyans in 2011, for instance. So again, this is um, a prime example of, I think, how power politics infuse the work of, uh, of the ICC. Now, in terms of the domestic disputes, yes, it's been the case that African states have used or invited or tried to use the ICC to settle um, domestic political disputes um, by making the ICC go after political opposition or rebels in their territory. Um, and the ICC also oftentimes has played along 
because if it goes after the state officials or the government military forces, then there is no access to ICC investigators and there is a blackmailing by the government and a withdrawal of cooperation. The one instance where the ICC tried to go after state officials was in Kenya and we, we all saw how, how it ended. Now, um, for, the, for the African context itself and whether there can be political solutions to deal with this, probably, I mean, we are still awaiting to see what the Malabo Protocol would bring. We're still awaiting to see what African states themselves would propose at the continental level. But I'm not very optimistic there either because if an African Court of Justice would become operational, I tend to think that that court will probably face similar problems than the ICC is facing right now. Great. Thanks, Uma. Now, I, I can see a clutch of hands. So if it's OK, what I might do is take a pair of questions. I'm, I'm going to go to Awiso and then I'll come to Benjamin, then back to you, Omar, and then um, I'm going to come to the hands after that. So, yeah, Awiso. Hello. Hi. Hi. Well, thank you very much, uh, Phil and uh, Omar. And uh, I, I did read your book, of course, because we run an opinion Yuri symposium on it, and it uh, is an absolutely interesting addition to my reading catalog this year. And I was quite fascinated by you know your findings and your arguments. So maybe just to link it up to some uh, recent events. Fatu Bensouda and uh, Fakiso Mochuchoko, if I get his name correctly, were in Sudan this week. I think they're still there, if I'm not mistaken. And they are two individuals who've been sanctioned by um, the Trump regime, and they use regime there very deliberately. Yet Sudan welcomed them. Uh, Sudan has not welcomed anybody from the ICC in the past, almost well, the past decade, actually. They, uh, Sudan prevented anybody from the ICC from accessing Sudan itself or Darfur in re regarding the investigations. But this week, Sudan opened up and welcomed ICC officials, not just any other ICC officials, but the two that have functioned. What do you think? I mean, uh, based on your arguments in states of justice, your findings and arguments in states of justice about how weaker states could and could instrumentalize the ICC. So Sudan, knowing quite well that these two individuals are sanctioned by the Trump regime, yet it's welcoming them. At the same time, knowing uh, the past Sudanese regime's relationship with the ICC, what do you think is Sudan's game here? Do you see any, uh, any correlation between what Sudan is attempting to do at the moment and the argument, the findings that you made in states of justice? And then at the same time, just to throw another wrinkle, and I think we've uh, talked about this briefly, you know, on Twitter, of course, uh, Sudan is still currently on the state-sponsored of terrorism list. I guess that's what the Americans call it. So these, all these factors taken to, including the latest events. What do you think? You know, what do you think is Sudan's end game? Of course, um, in regard to you know, the whole situation, and uh, specifically linking it to your findings in states of justice. I would just like to hear your comments on that because I find it intriguing. Great. Thanks, Owiso. Um, Benjamin, over to you. Hi, Benjamin. Are you there? Uh, we seem to be struggling with your sound. Um, is there a chance that you're muted? Um, oh, that's great. Ben, Benjamin's actually written his um, his question. Maybe I'll read it out and then I'll throw it back to you, Uma. So yeah, it looks like Benjamin's having some tech problems. But uh, Benjamin's, uh, he says, look, thank you, Omar, for a really interesting, thought-provoking presentation. 
My question relates to the ICC's legitimacy and the language of victims. As you touched on victims um, as all, can, all encompassing in the ICC's discourse, and, and this is highly problematic, notwithstanding the very important experiences and redress for people who've suffered because of crimes, um, as a result of the political use of the term victims by the ICC, has the term uh, within the institution become a bit of an empty vessel? And do we need to think of a new and expanded language for talking about the importance of individuals and communities who have experienced uh, horrendous suffering? Or is it possible to reclaim the language of victims from its saturated political use by the ICC uh, that is able to account for the complexities of, of victimhood? So obviously a, a question about this concept of victim and the way that uh, the, the, the ICC deploys it. Um, so yeah, Uma, back over to you if, if you'd like to respond to both the WISOs and also uh, Benjamin's comments. Thanks. All right, um, thank you. Uh, so and uh, Benjamin, I'll I'll uh, address uh, Oviso's uh, question uh, first about the recent developments between the office of the prosecutor and um, Sudan, and what can we learn from from these uh, developments? Um, so the one of the arguments of the book is that states are able to use the International Criminal Court to engage with the court in ways that would advance their own political and security interest. And that seems to me to be the case with uh, Sudan right now. Sudan, the post-Bashir um, regime in, uh, in Sudan. Um, why? Because, as you know, the, um, the ICC, the Office of the Prosecutor, had these investigations in Sudan and issued a warrant for the arrest of some of the top commanders and the Bashir himself. But the Office of the Prosecutor never had their own investigators on the ground in Darfur in Sudan. The day they issued the warrant for the arrest of the Bashir, the Sudanese government revoked the permits all, of all Western NGOs that was operating in Sudan and kicked them out, accusing them of being spies of the ICC, helping the ICC investigations. So the OTP never really had people on the ground to collect the evidence. They used um, satellite imagery, they talked to Darfuri refugees who were in Chad, but a lot of experts, some experts, had argued that even if Bashir was to be transferred to the Sudan, I mean to the ICC right now, it's not clear that the OTP has a strong case against him. It's not sure that they could actually achieve a conviction. So this new development of the ICC of then Sudan going to uh, visiting Sudan could be helpful for the OTP to be able to gather evidence and build their case. It also benefits the Sudanese regime right now as they're trying to move past the Bashir era. They're trying to reclaim a seat at the table of the international community, which goes all, um, in side by side with also this attempt to get removed from the list of the terrorists. <laughs> By, by the U.S. government. So all these fits within Sudan trying to reclaim a place at, in the international community. And if working with the Office of the Prosecutor and handing over some of those who are wanted by the court is the price to pay, so be it. So again, these are political calculations, um, cost and benefit analysis by the Sudanese regime, but also by, by the OTP itself, trying to have uh, access to Sudan itself to be able to, to build their cases. Um, regarding uh, Benjamin's question, yes, that's, that's a really um, good question about the language that we use, the language of victimhood and whether it can be uh, reclaimed. I'm not sure I do have an answer um, to, to this question. Um, what, what I find interesting about how the language of the victim is deployed by the ICC is in fact that 
when there is no guilty verdict, actually there is no victim. <laughs> so the ICC spends like, for instance, a decade telling local communities, you are the victims, we will try to seek and deliver justice for you. Then a decade later, when that trial is over and defendant is acquitted, then the ICC has no other option but to tell the victims, we cannot pay you reparations. There's nothing we can do because no guilty verdict means no victim of that crime because we were not able to prove that there was an actual crime. So again, this, uh, I guess I'm just trying to um, show the complexity of this victim image that is deployed. And this is not just about the ICC. This goes way beyond the ICC. This also includes the whole um, humanitarian um, work and uh, the NGOs um, or the course uh, themselves. So um, I, I think um, this warrants a further um, studies or questioning for the analysis whether the victim can be reclaimed or uh, whether we should try to move uh, uh, beyond this label and uh, try to find um, all the expressions to to deal because again we don't want to take away the fact that there are people who are actually victimized there are people who are actually victims of these atrocities we don't want to minimize the seriousness of these atrocities crimes that are being committed against humans but this language is also part and parcel of um, how we can deal uh, more effectively with these uh, these questions Great, thanks, Uma. Um, I'm going to take an, another two questions in a row. Um, so first, I'm going to go to Simon. Thanks. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, you can. You're, you're very clear. Um, let me try to put on my video. Yes, it's working. Okay, perfect. Um, well, thank you much uh, for the talk. It's super interesting. And uh, but now I'm. A bit lost like okay and what now so how do we move forward from this so uh, i actually really would like your opinion on do you even um see if there is a place for an international court or maybe even broader uh, do you see if there is a place for criminal conflict just in the international law and um yeah, i would really would like your opinion on that because i'm very interested in justice but um, I know there are lots of uh, critics on the ICC, but for me, I'm really in doubt that these are uh, concerns right now. So I'd really like your view on that. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Simon. Um, I'll also take a question from Sura, uh, and then I'll come back to you, Omar. Uh, Hello, my name is Sarayar. Um, I hope that you can hear me. <laughs> um, so I found this conversation to be really great. I had the pleasure of uh, reading this text already, um, and I found this to be a really fantastic conversation that in many ways um, encapsulates the heart of the text, and in many ways also expands beyond it in really wonderful ways as well. Um, and so one of the comments that I wanted to make is that it's really fantastic to see uh, what's possible when not just uh, focusing on critique, but also thinking as a graduate student, learning from this text, what it's possible to do when you think about uh, situating African state agency as your premise, as opposed to the argument that you're trying to uh, to drive towards. And so I've learned a lot about how what kind of writing is possible from this text. Um, my question orients around something that Kelly Jo also brought into her discussion, which is around the question of the justice cascade, which towards the beginning of the book, you also form relate really interestingly as an ethical question in knowledge production. You speak to it as a ritualization of international justice where unmitigated good is taken for granted. And you kind of reformulate uh, in McAuliffe's uh, citation, the justice cascade and the advocacy cascade, right? And I'm thinking here about 
the scholar practitioner space and what this means possibly for knowledge production around uh, questions around atrocity and mass violence. Um, and what, with this really powerful formulation as an ethical consideration in research production, what we can take away from what's possible and maybe how ac the academic functions of knowledge production have maybe brought us into some of these tenuous circumstances as we stand now. Great. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, back to you, Omar. Two questions there, and then I, I can see two more hands after that. So the, the questions are coming thick and fast. Thanks, Omar. Okay, um, thank you, Simone and uh, I'll, I'll try to be brief as to allow more time for the question. Um, to, to Simone, the question, how do we move forward? Um, is there a good alternative? What, what do we do with this critique and I think um, Surer also, uh, her question also addresses this. Um, that's, that's always a very hard question for me. It's a difficult question for me to, to answer because I'm not proposing any solution. I may actually be part of the problem. Um, but um, one, one thing I think uh, one first step would be acknowledgement and uh, contrition especially from the ICC and those who support the ICC. An acknowledgement that the ICC is very limited in what it can achieve, um, that the justice that the ICC delivers, if it does deliver any, will always be selective, it will always be partial justice, and it will always be uh, political. That contrition, that acknowledgement, would open up new new avenues to explore all the alternatives that can work alongside the ICC. It's not, it, the ICC doesn't necessarily need to disappear, uh, but if we would come to the realization that the ICC is not the response, that it is one partial political selective response, then maybe that can allow us to look for all the responses out there. And this would deal with, take care with the reification of, of the ICC and the Hague versions of, um, of uh, justice as the solution to conflict and crime and atrocities. And um, to, to go back to Surer's question about the ethical considerations um, that we grapple with as, you know, as scholars and researchers and this knowledge production and positionality. Um, unfortunately, I tend to think that our disciplines do not pre provide enough incentives or enough um, solutions, the possibilities opening the, for us to deal with those questions, to grapple with those questions. Um, one very promising and encouraging venue for such exploration is the Millennium Journal and uh, conference that uh, Kelly Jo and her colleagues are putting together, for instance. Um, so I have tried to think through these questions um, at that uh, at the conference, um, what are my ethical considerations as an African researcher researching these questions, interviewing victims of these atrocities, um, whether it's in Kenya or in northern Uganda or in Mali, and when I would benefit from this by publishing a book but the concerns of those victims are still unaddressed. So these are some ethical considerations that I tried to um, grapple with and hopefully um, soon enough um, I would have a, a publication coming out that actually touching up on this, um, this uh, very, very question. Phil, I think you're muted. Yeah, you're right. That's the rookie error, isn't it? You'd think after all of these weeks of doing all of these online classes, I'd work out how the bloody mute button works. Clearly not. 
Um, we, we've got just enough time for the last three hands, and it's actually going to be four because I'm going to abuse the role of chair and ask a quick question right at the end. But um, so I, I want to go to Richard, and then I'm going to come to Yasin, and then I'm going to go to Margot. So uh, Richard. Thanks, Phil. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're very clear. Great. Thanks, um, and to Omar as well for this for the talk. Um, it's been really great, actually, as also just to think about, as, as Kelly Joe was saying, about things a bit more in terms of strategically and, and imagining potential other ways of thinking about this. And I guess my question relates a bit to um, sort of the definition of politics that you're working with, Omar. Um, so, and I know this also is something that, that sort of Phil does in his, his book as well. So it looks sort of, you kind of talk about those various themes of self-referrals, complementarity, state compliance, and then ICC as a kind of stage for carrying out political disputes somewhere else other than in the domestic sphere. And it's interesting to me that you would select those um, those as examples of the political because they seem they all seem to react to an idea of politics or sorry an idea of the ICC as operating and reacting to a pre-existing political world that the ICC is still somehow outside of so of course I mean and as, as you you do mention in the book as well the ICC also in a it creates that world partly through its interventions. So it does that through those kinds of mechanisms that you mentioned, but it also does it by, say, not involving itself in certain scenarios when other um, international organizations are, are involved, particularly international financial institutions. Um, it does it by reshaping the domestic institutions themselves to make, to make them do criminal work rather than say doing more uh, property rights kinds of work that they might be doing otherwise. So that's a very economic, it's a very economic choice about what they're going to invest local resources in. Um, also in terms of what goes on in terms of po positive complementarity and outreach, what type of victim we're thinking about, what kind of state is being rebuilt, and all those are political questions that the ICC is involved in uh, and deciding on. So my question, I guess, would be, is why you made that choice regarding the definition of politics, and if the the, the phrase that you use about utilizing their stateness has something to say about that as well, because I'd like to hear a bit more about that. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. Uh, Yasin. Hopefully you can hear me and see me. Um, Sorry. <laughs> Omar and uh, Kelly Joe and for uh, and do you feel for putting this fantastic uh, event together? Omar, my question to you is uh, a provocation, uh, and it's a provocation in terms of how can we imagine an international justice system that embraces a pan-African vision of the world and a pan-African vision of justice that speaks to African communities. Uh, citizens living on the African continent, African leadership, that gives way for an African-based response to mass atrocities, or has something like the ICC in fact suffocated the space? And it's something that I explore certainly within my work, but I'd be interested to hear your perspectives, because I think your book, as I read it, just compelled me to think about where would Africa as a continental space and power house in the world be in 20 years, 25 years, 50 years, or will it forever be a site for international justice to be experimented, produced, and, and we therefore suffocate any ideas of a pan-African uh, vision of liberation, of freedom, and of justice? Thank you. Kelly Joe. I'd also love your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say as well, I wanted to 
give Kelly Joe a, a chance to come in at the end here too. Um, that, that often happens with the discussant. They give us all this great food for thought and then we, we don't always bring them back into the, the subsequent discussion. So I'm definitely going to do that too. Um, let, let me go to Margot um, yeah, for your question. Thanks. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, hello. Um, so uh, thank you to you both um, and you, Phil, as well for this very interesting talk. I don't, I don't study law or the uh, international justice system at all. But I have a question and actually bounces off from uh, Yassine's provocation. I'm, I'm thinking uh, with regard to the colonial legacies, these undeniable um, underlinings of the international justice system. Uh, I was wondering what promises you see in uh, the African Court on Human and People's Rights. Uh, I don't know if this is completely irrelevant in this debate because I'm not knowledgeable about the international justice system at all. Uh, I would like to know what kind of future you see for this, uh, considering that um, while most of the states uh, have not recognized or ratified the protocol, while some have ratified, they don't recognize the competence um, and so possibly could the African court achieve more than the ICC and uh, and that in a pan-Africanist, I mean, Afrocentric perspective uh, and maybe more as opposed to the selective partial and political uh, justice that you say the ICC delivers. Um, thank you. And Omar, I'm going to abuse my role as chair um, to ask the final question, <laughs> which is I, I wanted to pick up on your very early comment about the ICC being in denial about the political arena that it's a part of, in denial about the danger of, of being politically instrumentalized, especially by states. And, and I wonder how much the court's in denial, and I'm, I wonder how much it's deliberately in cahoots with this. Because I think that the court has often gone looking for this kind of instrumentalization. It, it's act, in, in pursuit of state cooperation, it's often been, I think, very aware, uh, but unmoved by the degree to which it's being instrumentalized. It, it doesn't seem to budge the court at all uh, th that it's being used by, say, Kabila's government in Congo uh, against its political opponents or Museveni's government uh, in Uganda against its political opponents. The court seems aware of that. It just doesn't seem to care because for it, as long as it's got some cases, LRA cases, uh, Congolese rebel cases, that that's fine. So in some ways, I, I wonder whether it's worse than you're suggesting. <laughs> um, denial would, would suggest that um, either they don't know about it or that they don't think it matters. M my sense is that sometimes the court very deliberately calculates that that's the kind of thing that gets it cooperation. And so it, it goes looking for, for this kind of instrumentalization. It wants to make itself useful to states, particularly African states. I just wonder if you've got a, a comment on that. And, and in a similar vein, I, I'm also thinking about a couple of the questions you've had from other people about where do we take these critiques now? Where does this go? Um, is there any way of improving the court and its behavior? And, and I wonder whether we have to go back to your starting point, which is that this is all about state power. Are there avenues through states to bring about change, to, to straighten the court up, to improve its modalities, to change its responsiveness to victims? Victims groups, civil society groups seem to be getting very little purchase in their own critiques, but this is a court that does pay attention to state power. Do we as critics, do, do people who are worried about the direction of the court need to start to put their issues somewhere else? And that might be to channel our concerns through states uh, who, who have the ear of the court, who can wield their own power to, to bring about change. Um, I just wonder what you think about that. So um, if you could maybe take the final questions that you've been given, I'm then gonna throw to Kelly Joe just for a, a really quick capstone comment from you, and then we're going to wrap things up. Um, Uma, thanks. All right. Um, thanks, all. Uh, we'll start with uh, Richard's um, very interesting question about the definition of politics. And um, so I, I don't mean to suggest that uh, politics is a bad thing. 
or that it is actually a pejorative that's not uh, intentional at all. I think actually it is the ICC that tries to say politics are dirty, it's a bad, it's a pejorative, we steer away from it, we only follow the Rome Statute. We do what the Rome Statute tells us to do, and that's how we operate. We have nothing to do with anything political. And that's the denial that I'm, I'm speaking about. But of course, you cannot escape politics when you are dealing with states and when your constituency, the members of the ICC, the bodies that ratify the Rome study are, st are states. If you are dealing and operating with and through states, you cannot escape politics. Um, and I also want to suggest that the ICC itself is a political actor. That it is not just, as Phil has very pointedly said, that the ICC is not just being instrumentalized. It, the ICC actually is a political actor itself, which with its own interest and its own image that it wants to cultivate, its own reputation that it wants to, to preserve. And luckily, in the last expert review that was just published, at least the experts have proposed some recommendation that point to the fact that the ICC should start viewing itself as an IO, as an international organization, and change its governance to fit with the mold. So it's not just a court, it is an international organization with all the pathologies that goes with um, international organizations. Um, to Yassine's uh, provocation, this is a provocation I like very much because I like to think of what uh, a Pan-African feature, um, what does a Pan-African vision of justice would, would look like. Unfortunately, I tend to think also that as long as this vision for justice would be operating through states, it also runs at the risk of uh, being used and instrumentalized the same way that the ICC is operating right now. And this also ties to uh, Margot's uh, question about the African Court of Human and People's Rights. Um, as uh, Margot says, the most states haven't ratified it yet. There's a lot of reservation. They did change the protocol to include in it um, immunity for heads of states in the aftermath of what happened with Bashir. They made sure that if this African court would ever come to be, Africans, the heads of states will be shielded and protected from prosecution by this court. So they don't want to do the mess they did by ratifying the room statute where they had no immunity. So this again points yes to that states are political actors ruled and run by political elites who have interest in protecting themselves and, and their interest. And finally to uh, to Phil's uh, comment, yes I, I do agree that I don't want to also say that the ICC is just um, a pound uh, in the hands of states that is being used as a football. No, that's not the case at all. The ICC has its own agency. Um, the ICC went after cases of self-referral, as you show in, in your book, um, in DRC, in Uganda, in the Central African Republic. Um, so many was quite very aggressive in trying to get these self-referrals because they guarantee cooperation from the state, and then they guarantee cases um, uh, for for the ICC to be able to uh, to prosecute. Channeling concerns through states would be an interesting venue to take, and I think the Assembly of State Parties has, over the past couple of years, become a bit more proactive in trying to figure out solutions and fixes to the ICC and delivering um, on the processes of how the ICC works. Um, so there is a core of strong ICC believers within those states. <laughs> and uh, 
for good or worse, I, I think also because those states that tend to believe that they are not threatened by the existence of the ICC, I don't necessarily believe it has, it's about norms and believing in, in these ideals of justice. I, at the end of the day, I think the states are guided primarily by, by their own interests. But yes, um, it's uh, encouraging to see um, these uh, actions taken lately by the, the ASP. Uh, Kelly Joe, maybe a final comment from you. Am I there? Sorry. You are. Hi. Here I was thinking I could just, you know, relax and listen to brilliant. <laughs> Um, I think, uh, you know, let me, let me say, for, you know, these conversations have been really, really interesting and I, I suppose Yasin's point uh, about, you know, how do we imagine a pan-African notion of justice and that deeply important provocation is certainly something that, that in, inflects in my thinking um, because I'm thinking a lot with Yasin a lot of the time and not doing it quite as well, but trying my best here. Um, I think uh, we don't need to find a pan-African notion of justice. Um, I think we need to think about who the we is. Uh, and I think we need to think about the fact that it is the self-same people who, as Yasin says, I, I think are suffocating uh, visions of, of pan-African justice who are also defining what injustice is. Uh, and so I think, you know, if we look at the, if we look at the fact that you know in the U.S. now with with what's going on with with the the ice sterilization of 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 women in in concentration camps, uh, that would clearly be an ICC crime, um, but because it's not within the jurisdiction of the court, it is not articulated as an injustice. So what I want to say, I think, and I think just sort of picking up on on what's being said, is that the, the um, the knowledge is there, and I think it speaks again to Sereo's point about, about the knowledge production side. Uh, the knowledge is there. Uh, we, if you look, I mean, there's a, if the, I read a speech by Emil Cabral at the UN where he absolutely articulated uh, African notions of justice through the language of human rights. Um, but that articulates through a notion of the human and the we that is not predicated on a white liberal Christian subject and the sort of liminal boundaries of that. So, you know, I think I think both in our notions of what prosecutorial justice is and our notions of critique. I mean, I think the way we critique is very much emerging from a particular form of ideology critique of showing the contradictions, ideology without ideology. You know, Stuart Hall was talking about ideology in many different ways. Um, and and that is written out of the canon, right? We can talk about justice. Errol Henderson, who I see has just joined the conversation, and when that happens, everyone goes silent. Uh, when Errol Henderson is talking about reparations, that is a knowledge of justice that is there already. It is just not taken as part of a, an articulation of justice because the teleology is within all of us who are doing this work. So I think, the, in the same way, when we look at Stuart Hall, when we look at a Haitian notion, the Haitian Revolution as a as a moment of of human rights, it's written out of modernity because it incorporates a human that is not just a white subject. When we look at Stuart Hall being written out of the critical canon, where W. B. E. D. Boys being written out of the critical canon, we can see also yes, and you are writing this an African justice. Kamari Maxine Clark is doing this. Umar is doing this. You know, the, this this knowledge is here. We don't have to find it. I think the we. I think what we have to do is stop when it is a white critical we or a white liberal we stop thinking of ourselves as both the arbiters as 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 any possibility of being the arbiters of a notion of justice for an injustice that is both central to our proliferation and that we were central to the cause of. Fantastic. Well, that that seems like a really appropriate place to end. I, I, I think on a, a resonant, provocative note uh, from Kelly Joe there, I think the only thing that remains for me to say is 
Uh, firstly, thank you to all of you for logging on and coming. Um, uh, there's always a bit of nervousness, especially in the online space, uh, about how to organize these events and, and how we'll gather an audience. But, uh, but you guys have turned up in droves, which I think is testament to the quality of our speakers um, and participated really vigorously. I, I do hope that you'll come to our CCRJ events for the rest of the term. I'm going to gratuitously just put the link uh, to our events uh, in the chat. Um, but the, the, the final thing is, of course, to say a huge thanks to Uma. Uh, for his book and for this presentation and also to Kelly Joe for such fantastic uh, discussant comments. Very grateful for both of you giving up your time and, and contributing uh, so vastly in the way that you have. Um, and, and I look forward to taking these discussions forward uh, with all of you as, as things unfold from here. Uh, have a great evening, everybody, and, and thank you once again. Thank you all.